Hello everyone, welcome. We'll just wait for a couple of, sec of minutes for more participants to join. Marhaba, ahlam bakum. Welcome everyone. We'll give everybody another minute or so and then we can start. We can start, Ms. Tadhil. Yes, hello everyone and welcome to our workshop about how your brain works, presented by Ms. Dinaz Kanji and myself, Tadhil Jafar. We're going to um, learn how to identify why we process some information and not other. We're going to understand also how we retain information and we're going to learn about the strategies to become better students. Now, first, we're going to start with this quick activity. I will need you all to focus. I will show you a list only for 10 seconds. Okay? Hawarikum lista aw qaima bikalmat. بس لمدة عشر ثواني فقط. Okay? And right after that, I'm going to tell you what to do next. Okay? So are you ready? It's only for 10 seconds. So pay attention. Is everyone ready? One, two, three.
10 seconds are gone. Now I need you to grab a paper and a pencil or a pen and write as much or as many words as you remember on a paper, okay? Write as many words as you remember. اكتبوا في ورقة الكلمات كل الكلمات اللي بتقدروا تذكروها من القائمة اللي حطيناها. And after that, count the number of um, words you remembered and write the number on the chat. Only the number, not the words. Write the number of the words that you can remember. بس الرقم. عدوا الكلمات اللي قدرت تذكروها واكتبوا رقم الكلمات اللي تذكرتوها. I can see seven, eight. That's really good. Yalla, what about the others? How many words can you remember? Four, seven, seven, six, five. Okay, I can see a lot of six here. That's nice. So basically, this is the list that we have. It's al it's in al um, alphabetical order, and they're all names of um, animals. So what happens basically is that most of you could remember the first couple of words and the last couple of words. Or maybe you remember the names that you are more familiar with. يعني مثلا إذا إذا ما حصل شفتوا كلمة iguana, you don't know what iguana is. Probably ما حتذكروها. أما cat, dog, they're all easy um, words that you probably are familiar with. Okay, now we'll do the same thing but with another list okay once again i'll show it only for 10 seconds and let me know exactly how many words you can remember do not take a picture of the list because i can sense any cheating happening okay <laughs> so only try to look at it for 10 seconds and then after that we'll do the same okay are you ready only 10 seconds 10 seconds بحاول اشوفوها بسرعه واحد اثنين ثلاثة Done. Now once again, write the words that you remember from the list on a paper and then write on the chat the number of words that you remember. How many words did you remember? Nine, four. Mira, did you really remember nine? Wow. Okay. Nice, Anish and Anas too. <laughs> Miss Dinaz remembered eight. This time I remembered eight because I knew what you were doing. <laughs> Okay, five, five, and eight. Okay, this time it's all tropical fruits, but it's not ordered in any order. That's very nice, Mira. Mira. Mira says that she told herself how to remember and memorize information quickly. So we will need your experience, Mira, later on. Okay, so as I said, this time the list is not ordered in an alphabetical order in any order and it's the the words are quite longer but still some of you manage to um memorize and and remember most of them that's really nice now we move to this one what makes information meaning information meaningful we have three sentences here I will need all of you to read them, okay? And tell me which one is easier to understand, which one makes more sense or is more meaningful, okay? Which of these sentences have more meaning? Read the first one, the second one, and the third. So write on the chat which one makes is more meaningful. 
number one, number two, or number three? What else is the second one? Second one is two finger John shoots pineapples with a machine gun. <laughs> Does that make more sense? You feel like this is more meaningful? Mm. Welcome, Dr. Amin. Okay, so most of you is, are most of you are saying that the third one, my home is not where I say it is. So the last one, what makes it more meaningful? What makes it more meaningful? What do, why do you think it's it's more meaningful? was easier to understand. Yes, it's easier to learn. Generally known English language, yes. The way it's arranged, exactly. So we can say that the human learning is about, is about making sense out of information. It made sense to us and sorting it. It was organized as one of you has, has said, the organization of the words. And also using old information to assimilate new learning. It made, it made sense to us because we could link it and connect it to information that we knew from before, right? All right, so now we know exactly what makes words or information meaningful. And we're going to move to the next part where we talk about brain research with Ms. Dinaz. Okay, thank you, Ms. Tartil. Um, just quickly for those of you who've joined a little late, um, Ms. Tartil is the, um, she's the academic tutor at the Academic Success Center at Abu Dhabi University. And I am a senior instructor of social sciences at Abu Dhabi University with the College of Arts and Sciences. So if we go back, Ms. Tartil, if you can go back to the list of the, the fruits and, the, and first go back to the list of the animals and then go to the list of the fruits. Um, you know, the question about what makes this information more meaningful is two or three things. One is that the familiarity of the words, right? When you remember, when you know the words already um, and you, re you try to recall them, it's much easier to recall. The second thing here is that um, we specifically put the list um, in an alphabetical order. Again, there's organization. And the third thing that we did here in this list was that it was all the, 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 the names were all drawn from a particular genre or a kind of thing. In this case, it was all animals, right? So when organization is, uh, when 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 some something information is organized, when information already you already know partly part of it, and you can add to it, that makes information meaningful. And the third thing that makes information meaningful is some kind of system within the within the organization itself. In this case, it was alphabetically organized. Now, let's go back. Let's go to the next slide. Now, the reason why the memory recall was easier, perhaps, maybe the first time you learn five words and the next time you learn eight words is because you knew what you had to do. The first time you had to listen for instructions, process the instructions, write everything down, and then you, could, you, could, you, you had to memorize. So there you had four steps to follow. The second time in which you did it, you didn't have to process the first three steps. You just process the last step, which is to look at the words and to write it down. See, now basically information becomes meaningful when you organize it, when you have a system to it, and when you practice doing something. And all of this will make sense in a, in a little while when I explain just how the brain processes information, okay? So the first thing that we need to understand is that the brain is processing information every millisecond, all the time. 
It's just that you're not aware of the fact that it's processing information. In fact, uh, we know from latest research on the brain that the brain is capable of processing about 2 billion pieces of information every second. So it's the, the capacity of the brain is massive. It's massive, all right? Um, and essentially what we need to understand is that there is a way in which the, the processing, the brain processes information. Today, brain research is showing us that the brain is even more specialized than we originally thought that it was, okay? Um, and essentially, the brain is divided into many parts. There's a left hemisphere, there's a right hemisphere, right? So the left part of your brain processes uh, everything associated to learning, to, to language, and the right side of the brain processes everything associated to nonverbal uh, pr processes. So everything that is spatial and visual is coming from your right side of the brain. But today we know that both parts of the brain are involved in processing information all the time and they work together. Um, and essentially what the brain is doing is that it's organizing information to make it accessible and usable. It's also discarding or removing, excluding information. And basically what it's doing, it's trying to make connections between different pieces of information that you have stored in your mind, in your brain. Now, very important for us to remember that learning happens all the time, whether you're conscious of it or not conscious of it. And we're learning from research done on, on newborn babies and research done on elderly people that shows us that, that learning continues throughout the whole span of your lives, okay? And it really depends upon how much you stimulate your brain to develop. You have to spend time developing your brain, okay? Essentially, uh, there are new, your brain is made out of millions of neurons. And the key thing is to make the neurons connect with each other, which is what, which is what we call neural connectivity, neural connectivity. And when the neurons connect one piece of information that it has processed with another, this is what creates learning and basically memory enhancement, all right? And you need certain things in your environment to strengthen the neural connectivity. So the process of building this neural connectivity is strongly affected by the environment that you're in. So if you have a supporting, nurturing environment that is either is created for you or which you create yourself, basically this enables you to build this neural connectivity throughout your life, okay? And the more that you learn how to do this, the more efficiently your brain begins to process the information, learn new skills and build on new skills and build on existing knowledge to, to make new knowledge, all right? Um, and so you can actually train your brain even until, you, until a very, very, very old age to be able to do certain things. So this is really fantastic news for the human race that we can actually train ourselves to be really great thinkers. Okay? And what I tell my students in my class is that your brain is like a, is a muscle. And like any other muscle in your body, all you need to do is to learn how to make it work effectively. So the more that you learn how to be effective in, in making those neural connections, the, the more effective you will be able to utilize the brain, the, 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 the structure of your brain, and whatever's and, and build on new knowledge and gain new skills. Okay, now there's a new term that we're beginning to learn or people are talking about in terms of brain research, and this term is plasticity, neural plastic, neuroplasticity, meaning that the brain is plastic and you can mold it. You can mold it. 
just like you can mold, um, you know, other things about yourselves, you can mold your, you know, the muscles in your legs through certain kinds of exercise, you can mold the muscles in your shoulder and your arms, you can also mold the brain muscles to become a lot more efficient and stronger and better at learning. All right. So let's move on to talking about um, the information processing model. Now, this is one of the earliest models that we have about how the brain process inf processes information. And you can see from this diagram that this is not a new model, right? It, it was, you know, was brought to us through the work of two very important scientists, Atkinson and Schifrin, and it's named after them. It's called the atkinson schifrin model from, 1960, from the late 1960s, 1968, I think it is. Essentially, what it's telling us is that there are three key compartments to the brain. Three key compartments to the brain. The first is your sensory memory. The second is your short-term memory. And the third is a long-term memory. And I'll kind of elaborate on each of these, you know, very briefly. So your sensory memory, sensory memory is basically where information is captured through your senses. Mashi, so you have five senses, this, a sense of touch, sight, hearing. You have all of these five senses, tongue speaking, so you have these five senses. And basically at any given time, your brain is capturing some of this, learn, some of this, the, the, the stimulus from your environment. So if I give you like maybe 10 seconds to think about it, if we just stop for not even 10 seconds, five seconds, just reflect on what you can hear in your environment. Okay, let's just stop for five seconds. What can you hear in your environment that you, you, you were not listening to before when I was talking? For me, I could hear the birds. I could hear a cat, a car went by, yeah? But when something else is happening, you shut out those things that are your, the, the information that your senses are giving you. So what happens is that your brain, even though it's absorbing all of this information from the senses, it shuts it out. It shuts it out because at this time it's not important. Okay, but it doesn't mean that the brain is not receiving these signals from your environment. It's constantly receiving these signals. Now, if you do nothing with those signals, if you do nothing about that information that your senses are giving you, that information is lost. It's gone forever. Okay, now let's say you are involved in a car accident and you're waiting for the ambulance to come, right? Your senses will pick up the siren of the ambulance and it will make it important. It'll, it'll listen out and it'll hear because it is important to you at that time. Whereas other times when you hear the siren of the ambulance, it will not make any sense. You will not even pay any attention to it. Your sensory memory will not keep it in your memory for a long time because it's not important to you at that point. So the key function is for you to move the information from your sensory memory into your short-term memory. And that comes by paying attention. If you pay attention, then it gets moved into your short-term memory. I'll give you another example. Let's say you're cooking something and by mistake, you put your hand on the stove, you get burned, immediately you get the sensation of pain. If you pay attention to the pain, then that gets, that gets then transferred into your short-term memory. But if you don't pay no attention to that pain, that sensation of the pain is gone and it, it it's, it's not there any longer, okay? So key idea here is how do you move the information from your sensory memory, also known as a sensory register into your short-term memory. You do that by focusing and paying attention. Now, your sensory memory is also um, basically a short-term memory, meaning it's there for five seconds or less. And if you do nothing with this, 
again, it's gone. And the only way to retain what is in your short-term memory is to rehearse it. And we're gonna talk about this in a second. And when you're able to rehearse it, it moves into your long-term memory where over a period of time, if you have rehearsed it enough, you can actually retrieve the information. This is basically the information processing model that we have from Atkinson and Schifrin, okay? Um, yeah, so you could hear the clock ticking, you could hear the birds singing, the air conditioning, the cars passing by, exactly. But it was closed out when something else was happening, right? Um, another very important um, experiment that was conducted in, in this whole idea of learning about how the brain processes information comes to us from George Sperling, who basically conducted experiments to see what is it that people remember and how long they remember things. So what he did was that he threw random letters on a screen and he asked people to memorize the letters on the screen and he literally left them up for like four seconds, not more than four seconds. And essentially he asked people to remember these letters. And what he found was that people only remember the top line and the bottom line of letters. Um, and even though it's in the memory, it fades very quickly because you do nothing with that information. Okay, and so essentially this visual memory that we have is called an, the iconic memory, but it's very short lived. Okay, um, people generally tend to think, and there's some research out there to show that people are visual learners, but actually brain research is showing us that your visual memory known as the iconic memory is less powerful than the other kind of memory, which is the echoic memory, which is what you hear. So what you hear actually retain, remains with you longer than what you see. That's what research is, has shown us. But now because of the changes in technology, people are kind of moving into becoming visual learners. And so, you know, there's kind of a, you know, people are not sure whether it's your, your, your visual is stronger or your hearing is stronger. So that's basically, you know, some of the research that's out there. Okay, we're going to do a quick experiment. We're going to do a new, another activity with you, which, which Ms. Tartil is going to lead right now. Go ahead, Ms. Tartil. All right, so um, we're going to do the Sperling's experiment itself, ourselves, okay? And first of all, we're going to show, it's going to teach you that, um, if, if a high note, if you hear a high beep, then you're going to recall the first, okay, first of all, we're going to show you um, this um, set of letters, okay? And after that, you're going to hear a beep. If the beep is a high beep, then you're going to recall the first row. Yani the salt high pitched, okay? Yani the salt عالي, you know, beep. That, then you're going to remember the first row. If it's a medium tone, okay, then you're going to uh, remember, you have to recall the first, uh, the, um, the one in the middle. And if it's a low toned beep, then you have to um, recall the last um, uh, row, okay? So watch, let's watch the, the video and do the experiment together. This is high note. Pay attention.
I think I think we can we can stop now. Yes. Okay. So the point of that was to see how you could pair um, your visual recall with the sound. Okay. Um, so they threw up the video, threw up different kinds of different letters, and essentially the key was for you to um, figure out um, associate. The, the words to the tone. How many of you were able to uh, understood the experiment and were able to associate the tone with the letters? How many of you got understood what the, the pairing was and were able to do this? Yeah, okay. All right, Mira. Okay, Tanish. Okay, good. You memorize the lines. Mira, I, I think you have a very good, um, and I'd love for you to share later on in the chat how you've been able to strengthen your memory so much because this seems to be um, a pattern in your answers that you've you've taught yourself how to memorize. Um, okay, you understood it, but you couldn't find each and every tone in the lines. Okay, all right, okay, that's okay. At least you tried, Hasna, that's fantastic. Okay, let's, let's move on with the slides. Okay, so essentially, the second compartment of your of the information processing model that's in your brain is your short term memory It's also known as basically your working memory. And here information is held for a very limited period of time, literally a few seconds. And essentially, if you do something with that information that is held here, if you process this information, then basically um, you can, you can um, process it better. But if you stop thinking about it and you do nothing with the information that is stored here, it's basically lost and gone forever. Okay, um, and the emphasis here is not on how long that you use that working memory, but, but it's on the act activity that you do, how actively you use your working memory, not the length, okay? So it's how actively, what is it that you're doing to retain the information in your short-term memory? Because remember, the key is to move it out into the long-term memory, Mashi. Your working memory has a limited capacity. All right, and information can be forced out by other information. Now, what research is telling us about the short-term memory is that your information that is not utilized in your short-term memory gets moved out or gets mixed up with other information. So your short-term memory already has information in it and if you don't actively learn and finish the learning process in this part of your learning, then either it's gone forever 
or it gets mixed up with something else or it's pushed out. Because there's only limited capacity, it cannot hold everything. And the more efficiently you use the information in your short-term memory, the stronger it gets and moves out onto the long-term memory, okay? So key points here, short-term memory has limited capacity. You have to use it actively. You have to use the information here actively. If not, it gets pushed out. Okay, so that these are the key points over here that you need to know. If we move to the next slide, how do we process some information and not other? We have a short video for you here. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. How do we process some information and not other? Got it. Okay, now try to remember. Think back to a really vivid memory. Got it. Okay, now try to remember what you had for lunch three weeks ago. That second memory probably isn't as strong, but why not? Why do we remember some things and not others? And why do memories eventually fade? So as mentioned, think back to a real- As mentioned before, the, it has, the short-term memory has a very limited area, but what makes us keep some information and others, we just basically lose them. The key point here is rehearsal. The most important thing is rehearsal. Rehearsal is basically repeating the information. Repeating, keep on repeating for it to be processed and stored. As we, we said before, and when we had the overall um, process of memorizing or memory, we said that rehearsal is where information moved from the short term memory to long term memory. And that's where we keep the information for ever or for a longer time. Without rehearsal, information remains for 30 seconds maximum, then it's lost. All right, so now we we had the information in the short term and we did rehearsal, we did some rehearsal, repeated the information, we processed it, and then we moved it to the long term memory where it's stored. Ms. Dinas okay. will give you more information about the long term memory. Yeah, let's talk about the long term memory because the goal is to move everything into the long term memory. And the question is, what is the long-term memory, right? So the capacity of the long-term memory is actually unlimited, all right? But we just don't know this. And the long-term memories are also called your permanent memory. And the key idea here is that we really never forget anything we learn, learn. I'm not saying anything we memorize, but anything we learn and the key is to learn, not to memorize because the memorization leads to learning, right? It's not the end point. And you know, sometimes my experience has taught me that students think the important thing is to memorize, but memorization is the first part of learning. It's only the first part. Definitely you need the memorization to move on to the other steps of learning, but it's not the end goal. And often when students transfer from high school to university, they struggle. They struggle because they have not been taught how to learn. They have been taught how to memorize. Please students, understand that memorization is the first step towards learning. So anything that you have actually learned, you never actually forget, okay? What you may do is not have the capacity to find that information. Okay, so often you will hear parents say, oh, I knew the name of that movie or that singer, but I just don't remember it right now. It's not because they have forgotten the name that they learned, it's that, that, that the capacity to re recall is lost a little bit. Okay, so the capacity to recall may be lost over time, but you actually never forget anything you have learned. Okay, now, just like the brain is comprised of three parts um, of in terms of the memory, 
The long term memory itself is comprised of three different kinds of memories. Okay, so this is what research is showing us. The first is what you call the episodic memory, episodic, which means that you remember events that are important. You remember experiences that are important. All right. So, for example, um, I always I always remember where I was when I heard the news of 9-11. Right? I will never forget that. I mean, you know, where I was in a coffee shop in New York when some, my sister-in-law called me and she says, you need to go to, to the television channel. You need to turn on the television and see what's happening. I don't know if this is real or not real, but I'm very scared. All right. So I quickly um, ran home and put on the television to see what was happening. Um, other things, your parents will never forget the memory of bringing you home from the hospital. Uh, you will never forget maybe um, the first time you got an A in a difficult assignment, okay? That, because your brain remembers these very, very specific episodes of personal things that, that have meaning, right? If it has meaning for you, then your brain is going to remember those things. The second type of memory that you have in your long-term memory is something you call semantic. This is where your ideas about knowledge get stored. So let's say you've learned how to, uh, you've learned all the names of the, of, the, of the body, of the bones in the body or the key organs in the body. Let's say you've learned something about motion or waves or uh, IT or something, any skill that you have learned, any information that you have learned that has been organized for you, um, these skills, these rules, these problem solving techniques, basically, which are organized in, in ideas actually get stored in what is called your semantic memory. It's, this is also known as your declarative memory. It's basically where you remember key information about certain things. The third kind of memory that you have is what is known as procedural memory, knowing how to do something, knowing how to write an essay, knowing how to put a PowerPoint presentation together, knowing how to ride a bike, knowing how to make a cup of tea. You don't have to think about these things. If you've done it so many times over and over, over and over again, and you keep following the same procedure, this is your procedural memory, and that knowing how to do something gets retained in your long-term procedural memory, all right? So obviously, your key as students is to move the information from your working short-term memory into the procedural and the semantic memories, okay? So that things become secondhand nature to you and you don't have to um, really kind of think about it, how you can, and you know, so in your brain actually takes <clears throat> what are called mental shortcuts, okay? We can move on. So how okay. do we improve long-term learning? Active learning promotes longer retention for, um, of information. So there are a lot of studies and researchers that found out that students who learned in traditional classroom setting lost 54% of information. But the ones who actually learned through role play or role playing lost only 13% of information. So when we when we act or we do it in a different way when we try to learn our information or our lessons in a different way rather than the traditional way it makes it easier for us to remember and to um have the information stuck on our minds now i need you guys to share with us what do you do to remember things what are the different things here we're going to use um, Mira's experiences, right? And the other, the, the other great students as well. Tell us exactly what do you do to remember things, to remember names, numbers, or even your lessons. Okay, kalimuna, shinu l'ashya illi istikhdam tuha, techniques that you used, um, how you use to, to learn and to remember things. For example, I remember when I used to in high, when I used to be in high school, I 
it was hard for me to memorize everything in geology, for example, because we had to remember a lot of rocks and stones names. And what I did is putting everything into a song. And that was that what made it easier for me to pass geology. So, so Janet is saying, uh, taking notes. Uh, Asma is saying she uses mind maps. She thinks they really help. Come on, students, give us other, other techniques. Yeah, uh, Siti is saying repetition and practice. Okay, what other techniques do you use, guys? Yalla, tell us. Because we want to show you what research is telling us is really effective. Okay. Yeah, so you say it out aloud. Okay, excellent. Oh, very nice, Fatma. You draw or visualize information. Zainab uses flashcards. Okay, so, um, somebody said that they take lots of notes, active recall, problem solving, writing it over and over again, Ramaz. Okay, very good. All right, you just pretend that you're going to be teaching it later. Yeah, actually teaching someone something, Noor, mm -hmm. that's really great feedback. When you actually teach others, it's a great form of learning. And often I tell my students, you really want to learn, go home, talk to your mother about what you learned in my class. And that way, when you're actually teaching somebody else, you will, you will know how much you have learned and where your gaps are. Yeah, very nice, Janet. You have a conversation with yourself. I love it. Very nice. Yes, excellent. That's very nice. As one of you here said, solve problems, write it over, write it over, over and over again. This takes us to the next topic that we're going to talk about, which is practicing. Yeah, practice, practice, practice. You want to be, you want to learn a really great skill, you've got to practice. Anybody know why Ronaldo is so fantastic at what he does? It's because he spends hours and hours and hours practicing, okay? So I want to talk really quickly about the role of practice. And when you're practicing, a lot of these things that you've already talked about, yeah, is basically helping you to practice. So there are two kinds of practice. The first is what we call massed practice. And the second is what we call distributed practice, Mashi. So mass practice is what a lot of you have said on the chat. You basically rehearse the information over and over and over again until you have thoroughly learned it. Remember, the key is to move the information from your short-term memory into your long-term memory. And the more you utilize this information, the more it moves into the long-term memory. So repeating, rehearsing, saying things over and over again, taking a flashcard, writing the key points. If you're learning about, let's say, <clears throat> if you're learning about the human body, taking a, taking a picture of a human body, labeling the different parts, writing it down, um, that is, and you keep doing it over and over and over again, it's called mass practice. And I really want to actually emphasize one really important part that I think we need to kind of pay closer attention to, and that is the more you utilize different senses in every part of your learning, the more you will recall and remember. So try to write and read and listen at the same time, visualize, okay? So visualize, write, remember, try to do this all, the try to do the three of them together. It'll strengthen your uh, ability to, to, to remember. The second is what we call distributed practice, which is that you learn in, in, in small bits and pieces over a period of time. We also refer to this as chunking, all right? So you take a big, big topic that you have, you break it down into smaller parts, and every day you learn one part, and at the end you put it together. If you chunk out your information into smaller bite-sized pieces and then learn to put it together, that is called distributed practice, okay? And it, both these types of practice are very, very, very important at several stages of learning, okay? Um, and the last kind of practice is by learning by doing, right? Um, let's say you wanted to learn how to change a tire, 
um, you want your somebody to teach you how to change a tire, instead of somebody walking you through it verbally, if you yourself change it, then you will actually learn how to do it. Similarly, if you've never used, let's say, Prezi, okay? So Prezi is this fantastic online presentation tool. You've never learned to, you've never used Prezi. Somebody walks you through how to use Prezi is one thing, but you doing it yourself by learning how to do it is an entirely different matter. So it's very important to learn by doing. So try to get in as much practice as you can. Okay. Okay. Um, so here are some strategies that we want to share with you to improve your memory. Okay. The first is what we call the paired associate learning, meaning that you, you kind of combine a big idea with an example. Okay. So let's say you want to learn about your body parts. You want to learn about the different bones in your body. Tibia is a bone. Uh, uh, ulna is a bone, your, you know, different clavicle is a bone. So essentially you're trying to remember, you're, you're pairing up two important parts of um, a, a piece of knowledge. You're trying to kind of pair up learning. Um, and that's a very good way to do it. Another way to do it is how people learn languages, how people learn vocabulary in different languages. So for example, if you're learning, let's say Arabic, and you want to learn different words, then you you write the you write out the <clears throat> you write out the vocabulary in both the languages, and you associate, let's say, kitab with book, column with pen, so on and so forth. That's called paired associate learning. Okay, um, you want to learn, let's say, the periodic table for chemistry. Um, you want to remember what are the different what are the different elements in your chemistry table. You want to remember, let's say, iridium, and you want to remember hydrogen, and you want to remember gold and lead and all of these things. Then you write them out together, and that way, in your memory, the two things are paired. The other thing is called serial learning. Serial learning is basically when you want to put things in order, and this is good for um, anything that comes in a sequence. So timelines for history come in a sequence. The order in which to do, um, to do things in mathematics comes in an order, right? It comes in a sequence. Um, associating images with locations. So, you know, associating, let's say you want to learn about uh, environmental systems, you want to learn about different kinds of geographical systems that we have, and you're learning about grasslands and desert and mountains, then, you know, pairing, let's say, the Himalayas with uh, with mountainous range, um, uh, taking the a map of Argentina and, you know, putting it with grasslands as an example of grassland. So this is how you would do it. It's called, uh, and then learning all of these then in order. Okay, grasslands, mountains, oceans, whatever you have to learn in your environmental systems. And then the last kind of strategy that you can use to improve your learning is what we call free call learning. Basically learning lists that don't need to be in any kind of order whatsoever. Okay, um, and the last one that we'd like, and, and we, we have a whole bunch for you on the next slide that Ms. Tartil will take you through. Um, essentially there's something called mnemonic devices. Right, mnemonic devices is basically a tool that helps you remember an idea. Um, and basically what you do is you connect it with uh, numbers or letters or different kinds of associations. So let's say you have to learn the order in, in, in which measurements occur, right? So you might want to use this mnemonic device on the right, King Henry died magnificently drinking chocolate milk. And basically what it helps you to do is to remember uh, from kilometer to millimeter because each of those letters, K, H, M, D, C, M, helps you to remember a different measurement, okay? A different measurement. It's easier to remember that King Henry died magnificently drinking chocolate milk than to remember all of those things in order because sometimes it's actually hard, all right? Um, 
Yeah, okay, excellent, Mira. So you, you really got this memorization, you know, visualization, memorization down to a T. Can some of you share a mnemonic device that you use? Or can you share a paired associated learning, serial associated learning that you use? Can you share some of these ideas in the chat with us? We'd love to know what you guys do. I would like to give another example of mnemonic devices. Yes, you know, guys, when, 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 um, how do you memorize or how do you know which, if this month has 30 days or 31, we use our knuckles, right? This is one of the, the, the ways we can do that this um, um, mnemon mnemonic memorizing, right? Yes. We used to have a song. We used to have a song growing up that for us to remember um, the days of the week. Um, 30 days had September, April, June, and November, excepting February that had has 20 days, 28 days alone. So we knew that these were the months that had 30 days, February 28, the rest had all 31. So this is what I learned as a kid a um, long time ago. Um, so can you share with us some of the other devices you guys use? Anybody use paired associate? I'm sure you all use paired associate learning and serial learning and mnemonic devices. Why don't you share with us? Okay, all students take calculus for the sine, cosine, and tangent. Yeah, for sure, Janet. Is there is there a way in which you can um, so you can you can use one of these um, strategies? How about how did you learn the colors of the rainbow? Is there a mnemonic device for that? I think there is. For the colors of the rainbow. Yeah, Roy G. Biv, excellent. Yeah, Roy G. Biv. You know, I didn't learn this, but I learned this through my kids. They taught me Roy G. Biv, okay? All right, excellent. Let's Good. move on, Ms. Tatil. Yeah, give us more, more ideas as we move to the next um, slide where we have more strategies. A lot of them were mentioned already by you guys like sorting, explaining, and quizzing. You know how we always do that? I used to do that. After studying, I quiz myself. I write some questions that I should um, um, answer later, and that helps me memorize and get the information stuck. Also, mapping, as some of you mentioned, diagramming and summarizing, when you have a lot of information in one paragraph, and just Putting, in, putting all this information into bullet points, let's say, or shorter sentences, that makes it way, way easier to understand. We talked about uh, chunking as well. Ms. Dinas also talked about chunking when we talked about um, distributed practicing, right? Which, is mean, which means that we break it down into smaller um, parts or information so we can easily um, remember it. Teaching, some of you mentioned teaching before, right? And this is very important. When you teach something to another person, it makes it way easier for you to remember it. Writing and labeling, sequencing. You talked about serial learning before, right? So this is what sequencing mean. it means that we put it as something in order, right? First step, second step, etc. Um, highlighting, we can see here we have highlighting. This is something that we use a lot as students. We use a lot as students, right? The most important um, information, we just highlight it or we write very important next to it. So we don't get um, distracted by all the other things. We just focus on the important things. Um, outlines, of course, are very important too because you, you, you order and organize your information in, in titles, subtitles, etc. It makes it way easier for you to understand. Also, we have here flashcards, as you mentioned, and practicing, as, just exactly as we said. So just keep it going, right for us, if you, have, if you just remembered any techniques that you used, okay, in the chat. And we'll see uh, 
Hasna said, I use pear drink. Yes, yes, exactly. It's very, it's very, um, I find it very useful teaching others and having discussions with other people. It just sticks in your mind. And now we're going to test your memory. Okay, Miss Fida just put a, a link on the chat. Okay, for you, just click on it and write words that you remember from today's workshop. Okay. This is our final, this is our final activity. We'd love for you to participate. Use yes. this link, go to menti.com. Um, we want to hear what are some of the things, what are some of the keywords and ideas about today's session, Mira, uh, that you learned from today's session. What are some keywords, ideas, concepts that you learned from today's session? We'd love to see your feedback. This is our last, yeah, this is our last activity and then we're done. learning It'll be very disappointing if you only learn two things. <laughs> very nice, thank you. Yeah, let's show us more. Only four people giving us feedback, yalla guys. Uh, looks like it, Mira. You're the only one writing, my friend. <laughs> Everyone, click on the link and just write the words. Any word you learn. Any words? Yes. It, and can can they write in Arabic, Miss Miss Tatil? Yes, you can write in Arabic, in English, mm. in any uh, other language. Yes. Practice. Good. Is it still you, Mira, or is somebody else writing now? <laughs> somebody else. Oh, good. Yes, yes. Oh, okay, yes, lots yes. more people. Oh, iguana. I like that. Pre-call, rehearsal, mnemonic device, practice, coconut, chunking. Okay. Yes, you remember. Cards. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Good job, guys. Teaching others. Yeah. Short-term memory is getting bigger because... Some more people. Yeah, are rehearsal. Cat. Okay. I hope it's not cat and iguana and bear that you're going to remember after today's session. I hope you're going to remember some of the key things that we taught you. Mind map. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Outlining. Yes. Very nice. Yeah. Okay. We'll give you one more minute. Keep it coming. Okay. All right, before, before you leave, we'd like to ask you to write in the chat um, from one to five, give us a number on how useful you found today's session. From one to five, write how useful, five being very useful, one being a total waste of your time, okay? We'd love to hear from you, okay. I'll be honest. Yeah, well, yeah, honesty is the best thing. We'd love to get fives, but if they were not fives, we're okay with that feedback. Mm. Oh, you guys are too kind. Will you come to other sessions that we do? Okay, somebody said two because they already knew everything. That's fantastic. I'm glad you knew everything. Yeah, please come to more of our sessions. We have a lot of sessions that we're offering. And we would love to see you all come to other sessions. Yeah, that's great. A lot of you are still writing on the, um, okay, yeah, 33 sessions. We don't expect you to come to all 33, Mira, but it would be great if you did. And I hope ultimately you come to the university because we have really cool instructors at the university who can teach you really, really cool things. 
Yeah, we're happy to share our presentation for sure. Can we bring it earlier in the day? Um, yeah, we will take that feedback back to the um, to, to the organizers that you want it to be earlier in the day for sure. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully, I hope so too, Ramin. And if you make it to the university, make sure you come look us up. Yes, would love to meet you all. Yes, for sure. Yeah, I'm very late in Australia and New Zealand, but thank you for joining, Dr. Amin. Michelle, you're in Canada. Oof, how did you hear about us, Michelle? How did you hear about this uh, presentation? Wow, it's 8 a.m. You're on a list. Okay, excellent. So keep staying on that list. And we'd love to see you all again, LinkedIn. Uh, okay, through LinkedIn, excellent. Okay, so for sure, we will share these slides with you. We, we, we'd love to share our information, no problem. Uh, we thank you for joining us today and we wish you all the best. We have lots more sessions coming up um, <clears throat> and I'm definitely doing another four sessions. So do come and join me on any of the sessions that I will do going forward. Okay, so thank you everybody for coming to our sessions. We hope it was useful and good luck to you with everything. Take care, masalama, stay safe and be healthy. Bye bye now. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you for the wonderful feedback. Happy holidays. <laughs>